are live streaming um, and live tweeting. So please, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to shoot them to us with hashtag MLTalks. Um, my name is Katie Croft Bell, and I'm the director of the Open Ocean Initiative here at the MIT Media Lab. And I'm delighted to welcome Wendy Schmidt to the lab today to share a conversation with her about critical ocean issues. Wendy leads numerous philanthropic organizations, including the Schmidt Family Foundation, Schmidt Ocean Institute, Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, and 11th Hour Racing, which is very well represented here today. Thank you for coming to Rhode Island. Um, through these organizations, she invests in innovative solutions and supports scientific and technological breakthroughs. Ultimately, her goal is to create momentum for ocean health, leading to the restoration of this vital resource. To understand the ocean is to know with certainty why we need to care for it, no matter where we live. So please join me in welcoming Wendy Schmidt. Well, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Katie. We just did a high five. <laughs> You're a sailor. <laughs> anyway. Wonderful to come to the Media Lab. This is my first time here. So of course, I've got some good news and some bad news. Uh, first, uh, I'm really sorry about the fact that you guys are at like ground zero for sea level rise here in Boston. Bummer. But the good news is you've got some very smart people here at MIT. And uh, perhaps when I finish telling you some of the things we don't know about the ocean that can kill us, some good folks in this network could make some key contributions towards some local solutions for Boston and for the world. The title of this presentation is a bit provocative, of course, uh, but let me explain to you why I'm out giving this talk. I'm not a scientist. I studied anthropology and sociology in, grad in uh, undergraduate school and journalism as a graduate student. I worked in marketing communications in Silicon Valley before going to design school, and I ran an interior design business for 16 years. In 2006, I started working in philanthropy. And these days, I spend a lot of time working on issues of ocean health and the connections between a healthy ocean, healthy soils and food systems, healthy air, and healthy communities. And I'm worried that there are growing populations of people who remain unaware of how intimately connected the future of humanity is to the living systems around us, including the ocean that contains most of the life on Earth. So I'm speaking to you today to offer new ways to think about the oceans and our connection to it, our impact on it, to encourage uh, changes in public behavior. I know this is very difficult, but it does happen over time. And finally, to help stimulate interest and investment in the application of new technologies that are already helping us to understand ocean systems better, to protect them better, and to work towards a long-lasting positive connection between humans and the ocean that supports us all, no matter where we live. But before I tell you more about why ocean health matters to everyone, let me take you to the most dangerous and inhospitable place on Earth. Imagine this. We're huddled on a plateau in Antarctica in the southern winter, braving sub-zero temperatures and steady 140-mile winds in whiteout conditions without food or water or shelter. Or, uh, uh, try this one, uh, we're climbing to Everest in the Himalayas in, in air that's freezing and we're dehydrated and we're running low on oxygen, dodging avalanches and falling rocks, maybe in another whiteout condition. It just sucks. What do we do? Ah, let's get out of the snow. <laughs> Picture us stranded instead in the Lut Desert of Iran, where temperatures commonly hit 159 degrees Fahrenheit, when we know that our internal organs begin to cook at about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. OK, none of it is good. You get the idea. But for the moment, these extreme and hazardous environments are seasonal, or they're intermittent, only sometimes forbidding for humans although climate change may change that picture. But the most perilous place on the planet, all the time, 24-7, meet the ocean. We all know that space is hostile to human life, but so is the ocean. You could say that life on land has its dangers, but apart from storms and man-made poisons and pollution, we've pretty much managed to reduce and control the obvious threats, and we've largely tamed the wild, but we'll never tame the ocean. Think about it. 
Ocean water is corrosive. The ocean can and does and will continue to inundate the land where we live, its salt rendering the land fallow, invading and sometimes washing away the world's most vulnerable coastal communities. Ocean waves can destroy what we build and can drown you. Its pressures will crush you. Creatures that live in the ocean can sting you, strangle you, bite you, poison you, even consume you entirely, leaving not a trace. We humans have consistently told fearful stories about the ocean, populating it with monsters with razor-sharp teeth and tentacles and uh, rogue waves and perfect storms and vindictive white whales. But for most of human history, all these things would sneak up on you because no one could see any of it coming. And yet, our ocean, our most worthy adversary, is also paradoxically our best friend, the source of all life on Earth providing the most fundamental conditions for human life persisting at all. But with all we think we know about human history and evolution, the truth is we know less about the ocean today than we know about the backside of the moon. So what should we know? Let's start with the basics. Submerging our bodies in ocean water, even for a few minutes, slows our heart rate and lowers blood pressure. It improves circulation and digestion. Our largest organ, our skin, is cleansed, and the mineral content of seawater reduces anxiety and stress and strengthens our immune system. A healthy ocean provides half the oxygen we breathe and food for nearly half the human race. Although in recent decades, we see this resource threatened. More than two billion humans make their livelihood from ocean resources. The ocean is a major part of the Earth's hydrologic system, representing most of the, of the water on the planet. As you can see in this slide, only a tiny fraction, 2.5% of the Earth's water is fresh or non-saline. That means it's ocean water that evaporates into the clouds that form to cool and rain on the land for the food we grow, or form into the fierce hurricanes and typhoons that tear our world apart. 68% of the small amount of fresh water is found in the polar ice and glaciers, the cryosphere, ice system, which, as you probably know, has been melting quite a lot lately. In April, a report from the National Academy of Sciences noted that since the 1980s, the rate of ice loss from Greenland, home to the Earth's second largest ice sheet, has increased by a factor of six. So the process is accelerating, ice melting into the ocean with all kinds of significant consequences for ocean circulation, atmospheric warming, and sea level rise. I mentioned that before, right? Sea level rise, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to that. But what else should we know? The ocean is very deep. How deep is it? It's 36,000 feet in its deepest trenches. So Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on Earth, is more than a mile shorter than Challenger Deep is deep at nearly seven miles. Another fact, it's dark, below 100 feet or so, and cold just above freezing at the bottom. And if you're a scuba diver, you already know the pressures of the water increase exponentially as you go deeper. So if you were to be standing on the ocean floor at Challenger Deep, it would be like having 50 jumbo jetliners on top of you. All of this makes deep ocean exploration technically challenging, and until recently, largely beyond human reach. But today, in the deepest part of the ocean, in the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean, we can now live stream vi video. And sadly, we also find man-made plastic waste. The ocean provides 99% of the Earth's living space. That's the largest space in our known universe to be inhabited by living organisms. And by any measure, it contains more than half of all the life on Earth. More than 90% of ocean habitat exists in the deep sea, known as the abyss but less than 10% of it has been explored by humans. Until recently, only 5% of the ocean floor had been mapped beyond a five-meter resolution. That's the limits of satellite imagery. But today, sophisticated multi-beam echo sounders are providing high-resolution pictures without disrupting sea life at all. Most humans are accustomed to experiencing the ocean from the shore, or from the deck of a ferry boat, or from 35,000 feet, we observe the vastness of the ocean, the scale of it, 
but the scale of our own impact on it in just the last hundred years is hard to comprehend. Just how should we think about our relationship with the ocean? With a healthy respect? Yes, I think so. Curiosity? Wonderment? We most certainly have to get to know it better if it's going to continue to serve as our life support system. Let's take a look at some of what lives in the heart of the ocean that most of you have likely never seen before. little Game of Thronesy, but <laughs> it's what's there. Back in 1966, when I was growing up, we had Jacques Cousteau's Undersea World once a week on my family's black and white television set. Color TV was new and expensive. At the same time, Flipper the Dolphin became a television star. But it never occurred to us children that the oceans or the life they contained had anything to do with us in suburban New Jersey. I don't think anybody ever told us. We visited the seaside and breathed in the salty air and got tossed around in breaking waves and got salty and sunburned. There were remnants of the ocean in our freezer at home. We had fish sticks and fried clams to have when the babysitter came. We even had a small aquarium for a time in my brother's bedroom until it tipped over one day when my mother was attempting to clean it. We came home from school to find her just back from the emergency room with her arm heavily bandaged in a sling. Like I said, ocean stuff's dangerous. The point is, Jacques Cousteau could have been exploring Mars for all his undersea world under the sea told us about the one we were living in. It was as alien as outer space, and frankly, that was the place we all had our eyes and minds focused on. Everyone wanted to be an astronaut. We found magic in the darkness of space, but not below the surface of the ocean. Maybe that was because we really couldn't see it well enough or often enough. It's hard to care about something you can't see. As Katie was saying, it's even harder to care about something you don't understand. My generation was raised in what became a throwaway culture. Here's a Life magazine story from 1955 celebrating the convenience of new disposable household products that were sold to free up time housewives were spending on cooking and cleaning. Today, 64 years later, as people continue to miss the link between the health of the ocean systems and their everyday lives, our ocean is literally under attack. In fact, we couldn't be harming the ocean more if we tried. The question is, why are we doing this? It's a killer combination. 
plastic and chemical pollution from cities and farms, discarded waste materials from the clothing industry, trash and netting from fishing boats, illegal fishing and overfishing, underwater detonations, indiscriminate deep sea mining and drilling by governments and industry. What a package! 4,200 oil tankers and 51,000 container ships are crossing the seas every day, carrying contents that don't belong in the ocean but sometimes end up there. The problem is we have systems designed to fail. Here's one recent example of what ultimately could be called the worst oil disaster in US history that almost nobody knows about, a spill 14 years and counting. Back in 2004, when Hurricane Ivan swept into the Gulf of Mexico, a large oil drilling platform 12 miles off the coast of Louisiana and owned by Taylor Energy buckled under 70-foot waves and 145-mile-per-hour winds. The platform dropped downslope of its original location by more than 550 feet, mangling the sleeves that conducted the oil from the wells and burying everything in 150 feet of mud. Crude shields were quickly put up to contain the crude oil and keep it from rising, and the platform was removed from the water. But six years later, scientists monitoring the aftermath of the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster a few miles north realized they were looking at a different, separate spill that had been going on under the radar at the Taylor Energy site since 2004. Today, estimates of ongoing leakage here into the Gulf are between 10 and 30,000 gallons a day. Multiply this by 14 years, and you have possibly one of the worst offshore disasters in U.S. history, with no fix in sight. In a poorly regulated industry, there are 4,000 drilling platforms in the Gulf of Mexico alone, and about 50,000 miles of active and inactive pipelines carrying oil and minerals to the shore. For every 1,000 wells in, a, in state and federal waters, there's an average of 20 blowouts each year. When the Deepwater Horizon platform blew up in April 2010, it was part of an exploratory well, just 5,000 feet deep, that connected to an extraction operation three miles deeper. That's not very deep by industry standards, where wells are often located at 15,000 feet. And until recently, explorations continued the search for new oil resources as deep as 35,000 feet. So just imagine the complexity of failures in deep, really cold, and really dark water. The uncapped well didn't just spill millions of gallons of crude oil, creating an oil surface slick the size of Los Angeles County. It also disrupted living systems throughout the water and along the shores for generations. It disrupted local economies of the five states involved, where 80% of people work in the tourism and hospitality industries. Only one in eight work in the oil and gas industry. And nine years later, the shellfish industry has yet to recover as its markets were snatched away by products coming from Thailand, India, and Mexico. People called it an oil spill, like it was a, a sippy cup that tipped over in the back seat of the car. But what it really was, was a crude oil tsunami that raged unchecked for more than two months. When I responded to the crisis by funding my first Ocean Health X Prize, surface oil cleanup solutions were desperately needed. It was terrifying to consider the problem of an ongoing spill that might never be cleaned up. Superman wasn't coming. So at the end of a year and proposals by more than 30 serious teams, we were grateful for what the 10 finalists did to address ways to clean up the oil spill. In fact, the winning team accomplished in 14 months what the industry itself had not done since the Exxon Valdez incident in Alaska 20 years earlier our winning team found a way to quadruple the rate of surface oil recovery. So the takeaway here is the incentive prizes do work in ways that markets alone don't. More about that ingenuity later. What's important to understand now is how human-engineered activity is carelessly disrupting the web of interconnected life in the ocean. I'd like to show you now a short trailer from a film produced by the Natural Resources Defense Council. It's called The Sonic Sea.
causing all these whales to want to abandon the deep water and get the hell out of there. One of the things about noise in the ocean is that humans are not aware of it at all. Listening on the headphones gives you a headache. Within 10 minutes, you have to take the headphones off, and the whales can't turn the volume down. They were trying to get away. You didn't have to have a hydrophone to hear the sonar. I can't imagine what it must have been like underwater. These companies damage the ocean without cost. And the sound of all of those ships literally filled our ocean with noise. There's a direct significant correlation between the amount of ship noise and the physiology and the stress levels in these animals. It seems like we are not able to do anything about it. The one good thing about ocean noise is that when you stop making noise, it goes away. putting the ocean at risk. And if you put the ocean at risk, you're putting all of us at risk. It's a great film. I think you can get it on Netflix and other streaming services. I highly recommend it. Um, I won't spend a lot of time today discussing the scourge of plastics and microfibers that are filling our streams and rivers and the ocean at an alarming rate. But let me lay out the basics so you'll understand what we have to do next. I've described the rising tide of consumer-directed plastic products that began following the years of World War II to add convenience to modern life. But it's reached a point where there is a credible fear that by 2050 we could have, by weight, more plastic in the ocean than fish. You can see here the growth in plastic production since 1950. By 2015, the world was producing 322 million metric tons of plastic every year. What began in the 1940s as products supporting the war, parachutes, aircraft components, helmet liners, and bazooka barrels, soon became Tupperware for mica countertops, naga hide chairs, vinyl siding, lycra bras, wiffle balls, and on and on until we have the single serve plastic water bottle. To understand how much plastic we're producing now, picture 900 Empire State buildings of plastic waste every year. And that number is expected to grow, especially as the oil and gas industry shifts its investments from fossil fuel exploration to the manufacturing of this very useful material. But we've got to learn how to recover it, reuse it, and then replace it. You've probably heard about the great garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but there are gyres of plastic caught by currents in every named ocean beneath the surface, containing billions of little degraded pieces of children's toys, household goods, medical equipment and supplies, 40% of what is collected is food packaging, soda bottles, plastic straws. 500 million plastic drinking straws are used one time in the US every year and are among the top items found in beach cleanups. So we can all ditch the plastic straw today. That's an easy one. Evidence of plastic pollution is everywhere in the ocean, as I mentioned before, even in the deepest trenches. A recent Schmidt Ocean Institute expedition to a unique hydrothermal field in the Gulf of California, which I'll show you a little bit later, was described by the principal investigator as magical, but also bizarre and mind-numbing, as researchers discovered at more than 6,500 feet depth amid the fascinating profusion of colorful, diverse living systems, Disney balloons. Elsa and Mickey Mouse, and even a flocked Christmas tree fully decorated with ribbon. Today, just about 40 years after the introduction of the famous recycling symbol, the global recycling rate for plastic packaging is just 14%. And that's an input measure for what's collected for recycling, so the actual amount of recycled plastic material is actually lower. Here's another disturbing fact. The lower the price of oil, the higher the cost of recycling plastic because the market makes it cheaper for companies to use petroleum to make new virgin plastic material than it would be for what it would cost to recycle. At the beginning of March 2018, the game changed when a ban went into effect in China, which will no longer import 24 types of solid waste for recycling. This includes plastic, paper, and metal scraps. You can see from this graphic that China had been processing more than half of the world's recycled plastics which are now streaming into Malaysia, Vietnam, India, Taiwan, Thailand. Plastic is leaking from land, coming from every continent with the heaviest concentrations, where people have the fewest resources to manage it. 
Worldwide, it's like a dump truck of plastic going into the ocean every minute. Plastic debris floating in seawater absorbs and releases dangerous pollutants like PCBs and DDT, BPA, which are known to cause endocrine disruption and cancerous mutations. Sea life mistakes this material for food, it's found in melted sea ice, and even in the deepest trenches of the ocean. You'll probably want to know <clears throat> that new studies have revealed tiny particles of microplastics in sea salt from France, China, the UK, Spain, and the United States. Concentrations of microplastics are found in drinking water, and even, very sadly, in your beer. During the last Volvo Ocean Race sailing around the world's oceans over nine months in 2017 and 2018, sailors who were alarmed by the visible changes in the oceans and were in constant fear of collision with larger pieces of debris signed on to bear witness to what's happening. They used onboard instruments, filter sampling, and wireless networking to construct a map showing concentrations of microplastics, that's a P or smaller, along the route of the 45,000 nautical mile offshore race. You can see that microplastic is detected everywhere, even in the remote southern ocean, with the highest concentrations around Europe's North Atlantic and Mediterranean coasts, and also around Cape Town and the Australian coast. You find microplastic in the ocean at arguably the most remote place on Earth, Point Nemo, where the closest humans to our sailors in their 65-foot boat were the humans above them circling in the space station. New studies out this year have located microplastic around the world, from farmland soil near Shanghai to the Galapagos Islands to the remote peaks of the French Pyrenees. It's clear now that high-level winds have the capacity to carry microplastic pollution anywhere and everywhere. We know microplastics have entered the bottom of the food chain, those tiny synthetic microfibers washing off of our soft blankets and insulating jackets and Snuggies and Sherpas, are being consumed by phytoplankton, fish and shellfish, and ultimately by humans. The effects of this in our bodies is only beginning to be studied. Here's a quote from last year, uh, two years ago, from the Lancet Planetary Health Journal. A great threat to human health, they think. But perhaps the biggest threat to the ocean is something that's invisible and hard to detect until you know what to look for and see its effects. The top 10 feet of the ocean hold as much heat as the entire atmosphere. At least a quarter of the CO2 released by burning coal, oil, and gas doesn't stay in the air. Instead, it dissolves into the ocean, forming carbonic acid. This process binds up carbonate ions and makes them less abundant, so they're less available for the shelled organisms like corals, mussels, oysters, and clams that depend on them to build their shells and skeletons. Since the beginning of the last Industrial Revolution, let's say in the 1870s, the pH of surface ocean waters has fallen by 0.1 pH units. That might not sound like much, but since the pH scale, like the Richter scale, is logarithmic, this change actually represents about a 30% increase in acidity. If your own body chemistry changed that way, you'd be in the emergency room. Creatures that build their shells are now threatened in the waters where they have traditionally thrived. You can go to mudflats in Maine, where juvenile clams are dying in acidic waters before they ever mature. Ten years ago, off the Oregon coast, oyster farmers saw a 70 to 80 percent increase in larval deaths due to more acidic ocean waters there. So between warming water temperatures and dropping pH levels, the world's coral reefs that protect coastlines and serve as ocean nurseries could be gone within the century. But what's most alarming is the rate of change. Today's ocean acidification is happening 10 times faster than the last known such event that we date to 50 million years ago. And that process happened over millennia, not over decades. And it was accompanied by mass extinctions in some species, including deep sea invertebrates. You may have seen last week's UN report concluding that up to a million species on our planet may be fa facing extinction, some within decades, due to the effects of industry, pollution, and climate change. Here's the tiny pteropod, the sea butterfly. It's a major source of food for all kinds of marine organisms, from tiny krill to salmon to whales. Exposed in lab conditions to the projected pH levels for the year 2100, shells dissolved completely within 45 days. 
An acidifying ocean is inhospitable to the shellfish we may like to eat, but it makes a great home for jellyfish, for example, which compete with other predators for small fish and zooplankton. Jellies are already the dominating marine species in some parts of the ocean. Imagine jellies as the dominant species at your favorite seaside resort, and think how that might change human activities and economies. Here's the takeaway. We're rapidly altering the basic chemistry of the ocean and stressing marine ecosystems that have evolved over billions of years in the ocean with a generally stable pH level. How will marine life adapt? How will we? Consider this. The earliest human settlements only appeared about 200,000 years ago on a planet that has hosted life for 4.5 billion years. Modern humans began moving into what is now Europe about 40,000 years ago, and just around 12,000 years ago, our ancestors began to settle in villages as humans made the revolutionary transition from hunting and gathering to farming. When you think about that, you realize most humans settled in places where they could hunt, forage, or grow food, where there was fresh water, and where the climate was predictable enough, stable enough, for generations of humans to build shelters, protect their young, and develop the language and cultures that could contain their learning. Those are just the basic requirements for human societies, but our influences in just the past hundred years may be putting our secure places on the planet in peril. We've seen how the health of tiny organisms in the ocean matters to everyone on land and to the future of humanity. It ought to matter to those working in industrial agriculture and concentrated animal feeding operations whose manure management and runoff of so-called nutrient pollution, chiefly ni nitrogen and phosphorus, key ingredients in fertilizers, is contributing to the rapid growth of green-blue algae in ocean water. When algal blooms, which are basically bacteria, form, they restrict the penetration of sunlight and interfere with photosynthesis in the ocean. And when the algae dies, it consumes the oxygen in the water. Most sea creatures cannot survive in these low oxygen zones called hypoxic or dead zones. Current trends would lead to mass extinctions as researchers at the Smithsonian expect to see even more dead zones in the oceans since warmer waters naturally hold less oxygen. In August 2017, we saw the largest dead zone ever recorded happen in the Gulf of Mexico. It was more than 8,700 square miles, the size of New Jersey spanning the coasts of Texas and Louisiana. And we know what causes it, upstream in places far away from the ocean, like eastern Iowa. This is a map of dead zones that we know about in the ocean, some devoid of all oxygen. Some of them are located in really deep waters of the Pacific, far offshore, where deep water is simply too far removed for a time from the air to, to, to circulate up into the surf and, and bring nutrients. But those understandable distant zones have been slowly moving closer to the coasts of Washington, Oregon, and California, occurring for days or even months at a time, showing up like the flip of a switch, killing everything that can't swim away, crabs, sea cucumbers, sea stars. And it's happening every year, leaving dead marine life littered on the seafloor. One scientist described it by saying, we can now say Oregon has a hypoxia season much like the fire season. A warmer ocean holds less oxygen, and a warm ocean surface acts like a blanket to prevent colder, low-oxygen water from rising up at all and mixing with the oxygen on the surf. The culprit here looks like climate change. Last year, there were more than 500 low-oxygen zones located around the coastlines of the world, a number that has multiplied tenfold since the 1950s. And that's only where we've monitored in total, it's an area as large as the European Union. Warming waters are also being identified as the force behind the invasive purple sea urchins that are currently mowing down Northern California's kelp forests, turning a once majestic deciduous forest of the sea into a desert. These huge sprawling tangles of brown seaweed absorb carbon emissions and provide critical habitat for many species, but warming waters have resulted in an explosion of the purple sea urchins in a feeding frenzy on the kelp. And they're displacing the red sea urchins that coexisted for eons on the kelp. And they're disrupting the whole fishing industry that depended on the red urchins as a source of uni, popular in sushi. 
This habitat destruction and disruption of species has occurred in the space of only five years. A similar phenomenon is happening to kelp forests in the cool water coastlines around the world, off every continent except Antarctica. As marine species migrate from zones they've inherited and inhabited for sometimes millions of years to cooler waters. As they move, the Earth's water system is moving too. And we can see this in the inexorable rise of sea levels around the world's coastlines. Here's to it. <laughs> Sunny day flooding. That's what they call it in Norfolk, Virginia, and parts of Miami. I'm one of the founding board members at Climate Central in Princeton, New Jersey, a nonprofit climate research and communications organization founded in 2008. One of its most compelling products is an interactive sea level rise tool that enables you to look at your particular geography under a scale of assumptions about global temperature change and see what can happen. Here you can see the sea levels along the east coast of the United States locked in under different assumptions of carbon emissions that could lead to between one degree and four degrees Celsius of warming in average global temperature. Some of the world's iconic places from Shanghai to Mumbai, London, Mountain View in Silicon Valley, California, and New York City are threatened by rising waters. Two degrees of planetary warming looks bad, and then you can see what four degrees would do. If we burn enough fossil fuels to heat the planet by four degrees, continuing a path of unchecked pollution, we could drown coastal cities worldwide, as polar ice makes a large ocean even larger than it is today. In one of our oldest cities, Boston. A permanent sea level rise of more than four feet is projected by 2100 under NOAA's intermediate sea level rise scenario. Here you can see what happens beyond that. Late last year, Climate Central introduced a new tool in partnership with Zillow, the giant real estate company. Zillow paired its housing data with Climate Central's climate science expertise and in a nationwide analysis projected the number of homes in low-lying coastal areas that will become exposed to chronic ocean flooding over the coming decades, potentially resulting in hundreds of billions of dollars of losses. This is under the assumption of moderate efforts to curb carbon emissions. I should add that to my list of ocean dangers. The ocean can cost us trillions of dollars. Very bad. OK, this is a very grim picture that I've painted for you today. And I, I mean it when I suggest that what we don't know about the oceans can kill us, all of us. The good news is that I'm able to show all of you this. And you and anyone with an online connection are able to go and find out more about it. Because we're living in an information revolution. And we have entirely new ways to understand the universe from the subatomic level to the farthest reaches of space, like this.
something for everyone here at MIT in that one, huh? <laughs> no, you want perspective, remember that one. A different new way for humans to see and understand, that's where ocean health begins. So how do we see the ocean today? There are the usual familiar maps like this one. It doesn't do much to awaken our curiosity. It's really about a world drawn and redrawn from a European perspective. You get a very different sense of the world if you just uh, flip it upside down. And, and, and uh, well, you see a huge Pacific Ocean here. But then there's this one. This is about 75 years old. Uh, it reverses the land-based bias of traditional cartographic projections. And instead of the ocean looking so vast, it's easy to ignore like background noise. This map focus focuses on the 71% of the world's surface that's ocean as one unified body of water with Antarctica at its center. It's called the Spillhouse Projection after its author, a South African-American geophysicist and inventor who, among other things, designed an oceanic thermometer to help locate Nazi subs, and also the weather balloon that was mistaken for a UFO in Roswell in 1947. Is this perhaps the image of our Earth we need to use as a reference so we can begin to understand? In what other ways can we now see the ocean? Well, we can use new tools to actively explore it and communicate broadly about its connection to life on land as a continuum. Here's the Schmidt Ocean Institute's research vessel, Falkor, rebuilt over a three-year period in Hamburg, Germany, into a state-of-the-art ship constructed using the hull of a discarded German fisheries vessel. Since her launch in 2013, Falkor has traveled the distance nine times around the world and has mapped in high definition more than 870,000 square miles of ocean floor, discovering important features like seamounts and shipwrecks and many, many new habitats. Falkor has no fixed port. Instead, Schmidt Ocean Institute is a mobile institute, offering to science teams from institutions around the world a continually evolving technical platform for ocean research and communications, including ship-to-shore sessions with audiences around the world like this one. We offer science teams access to our ship's high-performance computing laboratories, growing suite of robotic and mapping tools, and our willingness to test out new marine technology, all in exchange for one special thing, the real-time sharing of data. For us, this fundamentally collaborative approach to marine science was disruptive back in 2013 when we introduced it. But it has, in fact, brought more than 1,000 enthusiastic scientists and student researchers to work aboard Falkor during science expeditions. And it is indeed accelerating our understanding of ocean systems and leading to their increased protection. In 2014, Falkor's high-resolution maps of the Papahanu Mokoakea Monument, northwest of the Hawaiian Islands, led to a significant expansion of that protected area because we could see it, measure it, sample it, we could understand much more than before about the extensive biodiversity of the entire area, not just a piece of it. In 2018, we had a similar goal in a three-week expedition off the coast of Costa Rica, expanding knowledge of deep-sea ecosystems in the region and providing justification for the expansion of protected waters to include seven never-before-surveyed seamounts to ensure that they're not impacted by fishing or potential mining activities. Our high-resolution cameras live streaming during expeditions for viewers on YouTube have not only discovered new seamounts, but entirely new life forms. Underwater rivers. Life in the most unlikely places, like deep-sea hydrothermal methane vents, teeming with life, where temperatures are boiling and life is thriving in sulfitic chemistry. Schmidt Ocean Institute has been working with NASA to test new communications tools and technology designed for studying the ocean worlds of other planets, like the geysers on Jupiter's moon Europa that shoot out for more than 1,000 miles from the surface. Software and robotics targeted for space exploration are being used in deep sea ha habitats as analogs for studying microbial life on other ocean worlds someday. Our last expedition in 2018 in the Gulf of California tested multiple AI-driven robots for extraterrestrial missions. But back here on Earth, we've got our own microbial mysteries, different everywhere we look. In 2005, Craig Venter sailed his sailboat, Sorcerer 2, around the world to see if the 5,000 microorganisms that were known to science were all that was out there. Well, duh. <laughs> 
He circumnavigated the world. He took samples every 200 miles, and he found that they were different every 200 miles, so that life is local. I think about that, and I think about the new things we know now and we have just discovered in the last six years of FALCOR's operations. It's just the beginning. I want to share with you a couple of minutes from that expedition to the Gulf of California, let you see what it's like down there. Me, I want that moment of discovery and that just the adrenaline rush that you get when you see something for the first time. One ROV, two kilometers in the deepest area, and it's just a different world. It's just like science fiction, but it's the reality. Welcome to the live feed from ROV Sebastian, currently 2,000 meters below the Gulf of California. The possibility for discovery is so, so immense here. Okay, this is even trippier. Can you go down a little bit and get a better look up? Big old bag. Holy cow. What? <laughs> <laughs> this place has so much to teach us about biogeochemistry, microbiology, origins of life, novel metabolisms, and gives you a whole new perspective about how the world works. Most of our expeditions are multidisciplinary, bringing together a wide variety of lenses from mapping and morphology, geology, microbiology, chemistry, and even art. Through our Artists at Sea program, we invite artists to travel along on our research cruises and interpret Visualize what the science is showing us in ways that can speak to new audiences who will never read a scientific report. We've hosted 25 artists so far, and an exhibit of their work has traveled to 11 different cities. Here's the remotely operated vessel Sebastian, which you might remember from the video. A remotely operated vehicle that carries our camera and all kinds of other payload for the science parties. Sebastian's capable of reaching depths of 15,000 feet collecting even the most delicate samples with soft, squishy, mechanical fingers, taking the extraordinary expedition images and video material that we live stream and archive on the SOI website for anyone to study and learn about. I mean, look at this image. This is my recent favorite. You can see in the eye of this deep sea octopus the reflection of the lens of Sebastian's camera. This is like meeting E.T., another intelligent life form that we could never have seen before, eye to eye for all of us, everywhere. Since we built and tested Sebastian about two and a half years ago, it's completed 357 mission-related dives and collected 343 terabytes of data. That's a lot of data, a lot of ways of seeing from just this one device. Fortunately, and you might say just in time, emerging machine learning and capabilities and artificial intelligence tools are helping scientists to process and learn from the vast amounts of material that are going to be generated this way. A collaborative science team working aboard FALCOR has already been able to process data from multiple sources to create a 3D virtual reality rendition of deep sea environments, including a hydrothermal vent field in Tonga that can continue to be accessed and studied by scientists who will never actually make the trip to that remote location. All right. You're watching a sail drone. We got that footage here. An early grantee of the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, a program of the Family Foundation dedicated to find, fund, and help develop early stage marine technologies that can transform the way we uh, use ocean resources and protect them for the future. We do this with the tools of philanthropy, grants, program-related loans, and mission-related investments. Innovation comes from everywhere. I saw this during my funding of the Ocean Health X Prizes, like when one of the finalists for the Oil Spill X Prize turned out to be a tattoo artist from Las Vegas who got started by sketching out his highly competitive concept on a cocktail napkin. As Sail Drone went from concept to sea trials to its early missions, we were the high-risk capital. Today, these autonomous vehicles are engaged in a wide variety of research and observation missions for clients that include NASA and NOAA. On SOI's recent expedition to the White Shark Cafe, 
in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to discover why sharks fed from the cornucopia of the California coast would actually travel thousands of miles to the middle of the Pacific Ocean every year, the sail drones worked in concert with other robotic platforms to provide a complete analysis of what was going on in that area. Since its commercial debut in 2016, the company has raised $90 million in mainstream venture funding, and the company was started by a sailor. Here are a few other uh, Schmidt Marine grantees that we're excited about. Pelagic Data Systems is a technology platform designed to bring transparency, a new way of seeing, to the fishing industry. This can mean monitoring for illegal fishing activity in protected areas and compliance of fishing boats with those restrictions. It can mean managing boat activity in robust fisheries for their sustainable future. And it can mean providing information about supply chains, verification of where fish are caught and how they're processed. Beautiful picture of Thailand, manta ray microplastics is building the first automated low-cost microplastic center that can not only identify microplastics over large spatial areas, but it can also remove particles from the water and archive them, making information about the global patterns and degradation rates of microplastics much better understood. To better empower those on the front lines of conservation, Conservation X Labs has built a low-cost, field-ready, automated DNA barcode scanner that validates the identity of a wildlife or food product anywhere in the world without specialized training or even continuous power. The DNA barcoder will address the issue of mislabeled seafood, a commonplace practice that encourages illegal fishing in the market chain. When we look at the threats to the world's coral reefs, we realize the importance of steps to recognize which species can be resilient in a warming, acidifying ocean and how we can support the growth of more corals and stop killing them with oxybenzone-based sunscreen products, please. Plant a Million Corals is a nonprofit organization that uses the process of microfragmentation to speed up the growth of corals in land-based nurseries by 50 times relative to the normal rate, up to 50 times. We've been providing support to expand coral growth and training to groups around the world, especially where people would otherwise not afford to participate in places like Mexico and Belize and the Dominican Republic. The technologies are new. The targets are often complex and hidden systems. The challenge is to figure out the right points of intervention. A lot of my work these days focuses on how philanthropic dollars can act as a catalyst for finding solution to some of the planetary pro problems I've been speaking about today. They're not either land-based or ocean-based, as we've seen when we really look at them. They're systemic. And systems change is required. We can make that change positively with, ac with accurate information, new ways of seeing, and having the right opportunities, incentives, and rewards. In this effort, I've been working closely since 2012 with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, based in the UK. Ellen began her foundation in 2006, having set a world speed record in 2005 in her first attempt to circumnavigate the world solo, sailing on a 75-foot catamaran. She's the real deal. Ellen has done a brilliant job of engaging advisory and regulatory bodies like the World Economic Forum and the European Regulatory Commission together with industry leaders to create an important new community devoted to the development of a new circular economy to replace the old wasteful linear economy, the products of which I have been describing to you today. Over the past two years, I've been funding an incentive prize program at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to connect the breakthrough work of innovators seeking to reinvent plastic packaging and eliminate the concept of waste. The new plastics economy is all about recognizing the usefulness and value of plastics as material resources and finding ways to keep that value in the economy and out of the environment. Ten winning teams who shared a $2 million prize spent 2018 in an accelerator program, having access to industry experts, scientific and business advisors, to help them with their prototypes, marketing, and business plans. And last December, the teams presented their products and business plans at a gathering of several hundred investors and industry representatives from more than 250 companies, including Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, L'Oreal, lots of brands you know. And they've already committed to reducing and replacing their plastic product packaging by 2025. Perhaps 
The combination of well-targeted philanthropic contributions, connections to governing bodies, and challenges to industry could be the recipe we need for rapid systemic change. Stay tuned on that. I'll close with one final example of the work for transformational change that's happening in the way people think about human activity and ocean health. Since 2011, 11th Hour Racing has been working to help transform the platform of local and international sailboat racing, taking it from a sport without awareness of its impact on the ocean and planetary health to one that is now a leading advocate for ocean health and material responsibility. We're doing this in several ways through grants to local organizations working to clean up waterways, deliver clean uh, drinking water without plastic bottles, educate upcoming sailors about their responsibilities on the water, introducing a composting program in Rhode Island. We do it through team sponsorships, as we did in the last America's Cup race with the Land Rover BAR team, in the last Volvo Ocean race with our team Vestas 11th Hour Racing, with the 52 Super Series, and most recently, in the Sydney to Hobart race with Ocean Respect Racing that took third place on the podium and made their case for ocean health. To all the fans of this hugely popular offshore race, we've lost our slides. Oh, there we are, thank you. We support the work of 11th Hour Racing ambassadors who take on projects where they live and where they race. And also we, support, we provide support at the highest levels in partnership with race management to weave sustainability into the fabric of race operations in the race villages that attract millions of fans around the world. Imagine visiting a major sporting event venue and never encountering any, encountering any litter or waste. It can be done by design. And recently this happened for two and a half million fans at 11 stopover cities during the last Volvo Ocean Race. Up next, the newly named The Ocean Race, beginning in the fall of 2021, where 11th Hour Racing is the primary partner of the race, transforming the ocean race into a platform for public education at every port of call. Commitments to combat plastic pollution and changes in business practices came forward from 11 cities during the last race in 2017-2018. We hosted a series of seven ocean summits at stopover cities around the race course, bringing together leading experts from local areas with scientists, government officials, journalists, and our sailors to consider ocean impact of systems in their cities and to generate commitments from local governments to change. We'll do the same at a larger scale and even before the next ocean race begins in 2021 to keep everyone who's a fan, everyone who's a sailor, connected to the goal. The teams we've sponsored became part of a development of a materials assessment tool that measured the environmental impact of all their activities, boat materials, travel, food, energy, water use, that tool is now available for other race teams and in sailing education within the maritime industry. So we have a blueprint for improvement. Using our sailors as spokespeople with a direct and immediate experience of the ocean brings the story of ocean threats and ocean health to whole new audiences. We know that among people who look at the news media, maybe 15% read material about the environment. 85% of a reading audience is looking at sports. What better way to communicate new perspectives and to engage new audiences in the challenge that confronts us all? The people who innovated over the last 150 years to develop plastics did not foresee its consequences on the planet. But people today all over the world are beginning to recognize the price we're all paying for convenience and portability and cheapness and poor life cycle design. We're all part of the problem every day, but we are also part of the solution. I encourage you all to think about this, and if I succeeded at all in my messaging to you today, you'll begin to think of the ocean not as individual bays and gulfs and inlets, but as the force of nature, it really is, finding it more familiar and less strange. And you'll think about how it connects to your life and everything you value, no matter where you live. In the meantime, let's never forget the primal power of the ocean system that keeps us all alive. I'm going to close now by letting the ocean speak for itself. Thank you. I am the ocean. I'm water. I'm most of this planet. I shaped it. Every stream, every cloud, and every raindrop, it all comes back. 
to me. One way or another, every living thing here needs me. I'm the source. I'm what they crawled out of. Humans, they're no different. I don't owe them a thing. I give, they take, but I can always take back. That's just the way it's always been. It's not their planet anyway. Never was, never will be. But humans, they take more than their share. They poison me, then they expect me to feed them. Well, it doesn't work that way. If humans want to exist in nature with me and off of me, I suggest they listen close. I'm only going to say this once. If nature isn't kept healthy, humans won't survive. Simple as that. I mean, I could give a damn with or without humans. I'm the ocean. I covered this entire planet once, and I can always cover it again. That's all I have to say. Wearing our MIT red shoes, I see. Yes, that's right. <laughs> On brand. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I have, well, I have a million questions, but I think, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I think we'll stick to two, and then if we have time, maybe take one from the audience. So I'll go to the past first. You started in marketing and journalism and anthropology, if I recall correctly. How did you make the leap to starting to buy research vessels? That's not usually <laughs> one. <laughs> that there's some time in between. I'm there. sure there's a lot of time in between. So how, well, tell me about that path. Um, the philanthropy that, that Eric and I began uh, after Google went public started in 2006. Uh, I was inspired by um, a chalk talk that was going around uh, in 2005 by someone named Al Gore. He was talking about global warming. And here I am living in Silicon Valley for 35 years, and I'm surrounded by all these very smart people who haven't even heard about this. There's no consciousness about it. It's hard to believe that it was so recent. But we started the Family Foundation, and we're concerned about educating people around climate change. That was the first target that we had. And uh, that really means clean energy, doesn't it? So we started investing in clean energy grantees. We realized you weren't going to solve the climate problem if you didn't include agriculture and food systems. That's a major part of, of the system. And as the system kept becoming clearer to us, like a map, the human rights part of it came in, because again, that's part of the system. How, is this all, how did this all develop, right? So we're busy working in that area. Meanwhile. I got my first sailboat and started sailing in 2007. And uh, a couple of years later, I started diving. And I found myself in this ocean world all of a sudden, which was completely new to me. As, as, you, as I said, I grew up in suburban New Jersey. So uh, Eric and I wanted to find a way to combine my interest in this and my new passion about this, this undersea world and his interest in technology. And we realized that a lot of the work on ocean health is limited by access to ships. So he did a lot of research to find that discarded um, vessel, that German fisheries vessel, because mm -hmm. he didn't want to have to build a new hull. And, uh, and that's how that project began. And so this is a real uh, marriage of our, our, uh, both of our interests. And then to take it further, it was really about open sourcing, wasn't it? And I said that we give access on the ship to people in exchange for the open sharing of data. That was kind of revolutionary. Mm -hmm. in the science community in 2013. There were all kinds of objections. Well, someone will steal my work and someone will publish something. That actually didn't happen. In fact, it accelerates the work because people can compare their notes all over the world mm -hmm. and can add to this really rapidly growing body of information that is frankly searchable by everybody and why is that not a good thing? So that's how we, we got into Schmidt Ocean Institute. That's fascinating. How many people here swim? 
One box. How many scuba dive? Sale. Oh, good, good. Do you love it? <laughs> This is definitely something that we were talking about at the National Ocean Exploration Forum back mm -hmm. in November, which, thank you very much, was co-sponsored by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, um, and how people get into just knowing, starting to know and understand, and then starting to study and learn more about the ocean, and oftentimes it's through play and recreation, and that's certainly how I got into it, mm -hmm. and I don't know, just thinking about how that might... What are the access points? Yeah, exactly. And well, oftentimes that's sort of one of the, the lifelong kindergarten group here at the Media Lab studies. How do people start learning? And oftentimes it's through peers and passion, play. And at every point in their lives. Right. Uh, at Schmidt Ocean Institute, we have a citizen science uh, program where during some of the expeditions, people can go online and, and, and help us identify things that are showing up in, in the camera, right? Mm -hmm. It's like an interactive game that you could play. If, if, if you're off the coast of Australia and you're, you're with our, our live feed and you can go on your computer and figure out what you're looking at That's and actually awesome. make a contribution. Making it playful and How fun. How fun is that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to be right, but. <laughs> That's part of the challenge. Part of the challenge, like a puzzle. <laughs> One piece only, it fits. <laughs> okay, so now you're into marine technology and ocean science and sailing and art and all sorts of things. How do you see all of these different aspects of learning and knowing and understanding about the ocean sort of coming together for you? Well, there are two things. One is accessibility to wide audiences. Mm -hmm. Wherever they're starting from, you have to meet people where they are, right? This artist thing is particularly interesting because I had some, somebody who was an engineer suggested this idea to us when we first had the boat. Well, that's kind of interesting. What are they really going to be able to say? The fact is artists have a language of their own. Mm -hmm. And if they can bring people to awareness and interest through that channel, how is that not wonderful, right? There's all kinds of things. Um, the other part of it is we have this opportunity on the technology side um, to bring technologies that are already developed for other things into the oceans. And not, not in an exploitative way, but in a way of, of working in concert. I was talking about the amounts of data that are being gathered by these devices. This transforms everything about what we understand. If it's such a big deal to know there's millions of microorganisms, that's the tip of the iceberg. And I, I keep saying this to Carly, who's here with us, uh, who has been with SOI for, for a long, long time, uh, almost from the beginning. How, how much have we learned in just six years? It's mind-boggling to me. There's, there's been hundreds of years of research about the oceans, mm -hmm. and people pretty much think they've got it, but, but that's we're not true. just at the beginning of yeah. what's so so mind-boggling, and, and that's the, why I make the um, comparison to, to outer space, because somehow that holds all this fascination for people, and they're missing what's really here. And if we destroy it, if we threaten our own future, experiment over, I guess. We don't have a planet, you know, another planet to go to. <laughs> no so. plan B. Right. <laughs> but there's hope. There's so much I'm more we optimist. can do. I'm an optimist, because I can see so much rapid change in my own lifetime. I, you might realize that the iPhone only showed up in 2007. Mm -hmm. Think how your world has changed, right? When my children were small, there wasn't an internet. It's changed the way we do everything, the way we have every, every interaction. And think about how that scalability could change ocean science, too. Just the, the information revolution changes the way we understand the world we're living in. If we can look up from our devices long enough, of course, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> do we have time? Forward? I don't know how we're doing. For a question from the audience? I answered it yes, all in no? the talk. Answered them all? One question? One question. Anyone or she answered them all? Did I? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a mic coming right here. Hi. Oh, that's a lovely mic. Okay. <laughs> talk like this? Yep. I've never really talked to one of these things. I, so <laughs> you just talk to us. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the, when you were saying um, how people learn and the visual side of it versus, I mean, I, I love some of the, the film that you showed us too. Are you getting more into that too? As far as telling a story, it, you know, there are a lot of studies about how people uh, receive data and how they understand things. And the visual works a lot quicker and, and is, it absorbs more fully than text or, or talk. So I was just wondering if you were going into that area as well. I think you're making a hugely important point. Uh, context is everything. And a bunch of data and statistics don't move people 
emotions. They don't move our hearts at all, right? It's, it's fine to add those things in. They're very important, and they, they're a kind of language that, that scientists speak to each other. But you don't want to live in a, in a silo, even if you're a scientist. We have a program called the Schmidt Science Fellows now that offers postdoc a postdoc year for students who are going to study outside the discipline they got their PhD in, to take those insights into a huh. different framework. We, we've developed a lot of silos in the 20th century. We specialized in lots and lots of things with good outcomes. But when you think about people who are highly educated as PhDs who can't even speak to each other because their language has become so specifically grounded in what they're doing, we're, we're missing the big picture. And maybe that's part of the problem we're looking at in the world I was describing in my talk. The system is just, it's broken. It's failing. It's failing all the things we need to be healthy. The air, the water, the soil, right? The, the ecosystems around us that we don't even understand we're destroying. So you're right. We have to tell a much better story. I, I hope that Schmidt Ocean Institute and, and the other uh, efforts that we're involved with are really helping to do that with, with audiences that we reach. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wendy. My pleasure. Please. Thank you all.